Just to uh, Genesis chapter 36, I'm going to do something I don't usually do. I'm going to read the whole chapter, and I'll pray that the Lord give you relief from any pain you might experience. Uh, it's a lot of names, and uh, so it's not one of the usual chapters of the Word of God. Uh, but there is blessing in this unusual chapter also. So Genesis chapter 36, now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, Aholabama, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Basimath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebioth. Now Adah bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basimath bore Ruel. And Aholabama bore Jeush, Jaalam, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle, and all his animals, and all his goods which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. And the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. These were the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, and Raul, the son of Basimath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. Now Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Ruel, Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, and Mizah. These were the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. These were the sons of Aholabama, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion. And she bore to Esau, Jeush, Jaalam, and Korah. These were the chiefs of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, were Chief Teman, Chief Omar, Chief Zepho, and Chief Kenaz, Chief Korah, Chief Gatam, and Chief Amalek. These were the chiefs of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. They were the sons of Adah. These were the sons of Raul, Ra Ruel, Esau's son, Chief Nahath, Chief Zerah, Chief Shema, and Chief Mizah. These were the chiefs of Ruel, Ruel, Ruel in, the, in the land of Edom, and these were the sons of Basimath, Esau's wife. And these were the sons of Aholabama, Esau's wife, Chief Jeush, Chief Jaalam, Chief Korah. And these were the chiefs who descended from Aholabama, Esau's wife, the daughter of Anah. These were the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these were their chiefs. These were the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan, Shabal, Zibion, Anah, Deshan, Ezer, and Deshan. These were the chiefs of the Horites, the sons of Seir in the land of Edom. And the sons of Lotan were Horai and Heman. Lotan's sister was Timnah, the same Timnah that married Eliphaz, or was a concubine anyway. These were the sons of Shabal, Elvin, Manahath, Abal, Shepho, and Onam. These were the sons of Zibion, both Aha and Anah. This was the Anah who found the water in the wilderness as he pastured the donkeys of his father Zibion. These were the children of Anah, Deshan, and Aholabama, the daughter of Anah. These were the sons of Dishan, Hemdan, Ashban, Ithran, and Kiran. These were the sons of Ezer, Bilhan, Zaavan, and Akan. These were the sons of Dishan, Uz, and Aaron. These were the chiefs of the Horites, Chief Lotan, Chief Shobal, Chief Sibion, Chief Anah, Chief Dishan, Chief Ezer, and Chief Dishan. These were the chiefs of the Horites, according to their chiefs, in the land of Seir. Now these were the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the children of Israel. Uh, Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhaba. And when Bilah died, Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his place. When Jobab died, Husham of the land of the Temanites reigned in his place. And when Husham died, Hadad, the son of Bedad, who attacked Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his place. And the name of his city was Avith. 
When Hadad died, Samla of Masrika reigned in his place. And when Samla died, Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his place. When Saul died, Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his place. And when Baal Hanan, the son of Akbor, died, Hadar reigned in his place, and the name of his city was Pa. His wife's name was Mahat Mahetabal, uh, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mizahab. These were the names of the chiefs of Esau, according to their families and their places, by their names, Chief Timnah, Chief Alva, Chief Jetheth, Chief Aholabama, Chief Elah, Chief Pinan, Chief Kenaz, Chief Timen, Chief Mibzar, Chief Magdiel, and Chief Iram. These were the chiefs of Edom, according to their dwelling places. In the land of their possession, Esau was the father of the Edomites. Thus ends our reading. Let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy, infallible, and inspired word, a word that is, uh, seems so useless to so many of us and, and uh, uh, of little or no significance, yet, Father, there is, there is good food here. But we need your Holy Spirit. Father, be with my mouth, uh, be with my heart and mind, bring together the meditation of, 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 my, of my heart and mind in such a way that is pleasing to you. And please be with each one here present, each one listening, uh, that they might be strengthened, encouraged, and lifted up through the word that is given out of this text. All these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Genesis 36 is one of those chapters, no doubt, that most readers of the Bible and many Christians will read once and shake their heads, roll their eyes, and not read again. That's just a fact. That's just a reality. When you read that story and then you're thinking about it's Esau's lineage and he's one of the fallen ones, why is so much attention given to this? Why would the divine writer use, uh, use uh, so much of his sacred real estate uh, on, on a description of Esau and his family in this place called Edom. And uh, admittedly, while it does seem boring to us, uh, there, there is a, a, a great purpose behind uh, the, the, the writing of this text. And, and the fact is, is it's, it's, a, it's a warning to God's people. Uh, it's actually a warning against those who reject God and his covenant. It's a warning to Christian families about the dangers of compromise with the world. This chapter, brothers and sisters, is a very powerful testimony, actually, of what happens among men and nations when they reject the truth of God, the word, and the kingship of God. So I'm talking about across the earth, and this is a reality that the truth of God offers one way of, of blessing to the people of the earth, to humans. Any other way than that is going to lead into a bad place. And, and that's part of what this, this, uh, this, is what this uh, text is, is illustrating. The trajectory or the direction of Esau and his nation of Edom is exactly the direction or trajectory of every nation and people who reject the truth of God, the word of God, and the kingship of God. This chapter was meant as a, as a warning to Israel, because remember, Moses is giving this to, to the Israelites as they're getting ready to enter into the new land of Canaan. And, and so this chapter actually says, okay, here's a, here's a 300 to 400 year history of a people that are your brothers. This is the brother of Jacob. This is his nation, this is his people, and this is where they're at. Take note. This is where you could be at if you do not uh, follow the words that I give you. So um, Esau was born into a covenant family and received the covenant sign of circumcision. And Genesis 36 is telling us the story of how he rejected the covenant family and the covenant relationship for a better uh, life in this world. He wanted something better, something more than what he had in Canaan. And so he went searching for something better. It's no accident that, that Genesis chapter 36 begins by telling us of Esau's marriages to these Canaanite or Hittite women. Um, from an outward perspective of his rejection, right? So I, I, when I say outward perspective, uh, we're not looking at the inside, what he's thinking inside of his heart. We're just looking at what we see and what, what is he doing? He's marrying somebody that's displeasing um, to his parents and 
to his grandfather. His grandfather was already dead by then. But um, to Abraham, this would not have been a good choice. Esau, like Jacob, knew Abraham and Isaac's history. He knew the story of Abraham sending his most trusted servant, Eliezer, all the way back to Paddan Aram to get a wife from the family of Shem. That's a key thing, by the way, brothers and sisters. Uh, and Abraham's instructions to Eliezer began with this way, you, sh you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So what is the difference? And I wanted to, to ask that question because I, I don't think I've dealt with that. What is the difference between getting a wife from the descendants of Shem instead of getting a wife from the descendants of Ham or Canaan? And it's, it's literally the difference in the world, right? Because the difference was that there was a curse against the descendants of, Ham, of, of Canaan. And, and just to remind you of that, in Genesis chapter 9, we read in verse 25 through 27, then he, that is Noah, said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, the other brother, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant, in, in essence, also. Now notice two things about that. The first thing is that God honored Abraham and Isaac and Jacob for not marrying the daughters of, of Canaan because of that curse against them. But second, and, and perhaps even more beautiful, is, is the fact that God put it into the heart of Abraham to go down to the land of Canaan. Why? So that Canaan might ultimately be redeemed from the curse. Don't mix with them, but you are going down so that in the end there can be salvation. But the redemption from the curse would not and could not come from mixing and merging the covenant descendants of, of uh, Shem with the cursed descendants of, 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 of Canaan, right? The, the idea is, is it, you can't just go down there and just hang out and God's going to bless you and then you just start marrying these cursed tribes and, and just merge together and somehow everything's going to be better. And he's, that's not going to work. Those under the, uh, the curse would ultimately be redeemed by someone who would come from the blessed covenant line of Israel. A covenant son who could and would obey all the laws and the words of God. And through that obedience of the law and the word of God, he would be able to offer himself up as a perfect sacrifice for all who are under the curse of sin. This is why Esau's marriage to the, to the two daughters of the cursed descendants of Canaan was so displeasing to his parents. And that is also why this chapter about Esau's descendants and nations begins with his marriages to these women. In, in many ways, this was the beginning or the first step of his disobedience and his trajectory away, walking away from the path of the Lord. And, and our text reflects that next step, right? Because the next step, we actually see it in verses six, uh, in 6 and 7. In 6, we read this, Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle, and all his animals, and all his goods which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away. And we'll stop right there. Uh, that first part of that, verse 6 there, uh, should be an echo. And it's an echo, brothers and sisters, of Genesis 12, verse 5, which is interesting, right? Because this is after God calls Abraham and sends him away. And then it says in verse 5, then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. And, and so, excuse me, the first thing that we see is, is that, wow, that sounds a lot like Abram obeying the word of God, except this man is going in the opposite direction. He's going away from where God has sent his people. So, uh, that, and so we see that reflected in the next part of the text, right? Because it says that he's going away from the, from the presence, and the, and the literal is from the, from the face of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. That, again, is an echo 
But this echo goes back to Genesis chapter 13, verse 6. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And that's talking about Abraham and Lot. And that's when Lot separates from Abram, and he ends up going down to Sodom, and we know what happened there. It is not a good story. It is not, a, it's not an upward trajectory. It is definitely a down. You're leaving Abraham. You're leaving the man that is in covenant with God. You're leaving that to go over here, to depart from that, and, and what's gonna, what good is going to happen. And, and so what the Word of God is telling us is that Esau is kind of doing the exact same thing. So one of the great truths, brothers and sisters, that's being demonstrated here is the fact that if we're going to follow the Lord, we have to accept the limitations that he places upon us. Abraham was the chosen one of God, and Lot should have placed his relationship with Abraham and with God above his desires, uh, above his own desires in this world. And the exact same thing is true of Esau. As a child of the covenant, he should have placed the interest of God above his own interest. Being a child of God in this world is not easy. That is a fact. That is a reality. Um, think of how God tested Abraham. First, he made him wait for 25 years to get the promised son. But remember, before the promised son came, he had another son named Ishmael. And, and when God came to him in Genesis uh, 17 and, and, and made that covenant with him, the covenant of circumcision, he, he begged the Lord that, that Ishmael would live before your face. Can, can, can he be the firstborn son? And, and God said, no, he's not the one. He actually had to reject Ishmael. He had to send him away. And again, that's not easy. That's his firstborn son. He loved him. There's no doubt about that. And, and yet God says, this is my, this is my boundary. It's, it's not going to be him. And these two are not going to be able to coexist. You're going to have to send him away. And Abraham was obedient to that. And then, of course, they have Isaac. And then when he's 15, between 15 and 25 years old, they, they estimate, um, God comes to him and says, I, I want you to offer Isaac up as a burnt offering. That's not, e an, easy, that's not an easy path that, he, that he's calling his people to. The same thing with Jacob. It was God who required that Jacob humble himself before his, his brother Esau. Uh, we, we went through that whole thing in, in Genesis 32 and 33 where, where Jacob is coming to face Esau and he is literally thinking they're all going to get wiped out. They're all going to die. And God keeps working deeper and deeper into his heart and, and we see that it ends up, it's revealed to him, you need to humble yourself before your brother. You might be the bakor. You might be the firstborn of the covenant because I've given it to you, but you are going to have to humble and submit yourself to your brother at this moment. That's not an easy thing. And, and, and you can actually see the pain of it as Jacob goes through this whole process before he's able to actually humble himself before his brother. So, but he did it. But brothers and sisters, that's part of what it means. If we're going to follow God, if we're going to follow Christ, we, we, have, to, we have to humble and submit ourselves to his rules for our life. So it's the same thing is true about Esau when it came to honoring God's covenant. He had been circumcised and he was a member of the covenant family of God and that means in the end that he needed to recognize that he needed to submit himself to Jacob. Instead of looking at the land and looking how many flocks and herds they have and saying it's just too hard to, I don't want to duke it out with my brother so I'm just going to leave, what he should have done and, and it's easy for me to say, but I'm just t telling you from a scriptural uh, context, it, it, he should have gone to his brother and said, what are we going to do about this? How can we exist together? Because I believe in the covenant. I believe that God has chosen you as the firstborn. And, and, and so what do I need to do? What do we need to do to come together so that we can coexist uh, and, and that you would honor the relationship with God and your brother above your own desires. But in his pride, he could not do that. And, and, and brother and sister, there's a huge message, message there. If you and I are going to have a blessed relationship with God, God's desires for our life must have dominion in our life. 
And you and I will experience the tug of war. If you're a Christian, but you don't ever experience a tug of war between your desires and in your ambitions and what God wants for you, then you are asleep. You are not awake. You are not really dealing with things that they ought to be dealing. What's really happening is you're fulfilling your own desires in this world and you just think that you're with God. Because if you actually are hearing God and coming to God in prayer, but also you're living your life out, you're going to hit crossroads. And, and, and you're going to find that there's points in your life that I want to go this way. This is what I want to go. If I had my druthers, this is the direction I would go. So why don't I go that way? Because I know from the Word of God, from the Spirit of God in me, and, and from the conscience that's working in me too, I think he wants me to go this way. That's what it means to follow God. That's what it means to follow Jesus Christ. You're going to have to give up things. There's going to be times that, that your ambitions and desires are going to pull you this way, but what you know about the Word of God, the truth of God, the gospel is going to say you need to go this way. So when that happens to Esau, he just says, whatever, and he takes off. And he leaves the covenant land, he leaves the covenant people, and he goes off on his own. And so, uh, I just remind us of, of, this, of this text in, in Philippians 3. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. You will, you will experience that in this life. And if you don't, something is not right. Now, on the other hand, if you feel it, and you really feel it, then know this. Be encouraged by this. That's actually the Spirit of God working in you, and there's some honesty. There's some transparency. There's, there's some openness in your heart and mind. You can see the problem. Seeing the problem is important. There's a lot of people that confess Christianity and have no idea of the real strife of Christianity. They just blithely go around. I mean, we see it in our nation today. There's all kinds of people confessing Christianity that are voting for politicians and, and that are giving money to people that are, in, are fine with abortion and homosexual marriage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that's against the word of God, but they're fine with it. Why? Well, I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. That's all there is to it, right? No. The whole word of God tells us who God is and what he's about. And loving God means following Him and what He says, not what you think. And, and that does come into conflict, and, and this is what Esau is dealing with. But now, there's a lot of stuff in this, in, in this text. I want to just point out a couple of things. First of all, I want to point out a trajectory. So it starts out, everybody's being named, and they just are regular names. You have Esau's name, you have his son's names, you have the, the grandson's names, okay? So they're all just names. They're all, there's a certain equality among all these names. But then in verse uh, 15, we see that these are the chiefs. We're introduced to a, to a new title, and, and that title in the Hebrew is aloof. And, and that's the word, aloof. And, and it's actually a nice word. It, it means friend. Uh, in, in the, uh, as an adjective, it, it, it means harmless, gentle. Uh, it means trusted. And so what it is, is it, it's a title of somebody that's the head of a family the, and becoming the head of a tribe. But he's not high up and, and away from his people. He's close. He's a friend. I'm, I'm one of you, you know, we're, we're, we're connected, we're the same. He's not somebody who is enforcing uh, his will through his power, through his position. He's a friend to his people, he's, he's one of them. He can be trusted, he's gentle in his leadership. And we see that trajectory also in the sons of Seir. And the reason that there's a, a lineage of the sons of Seir is because that the sons of Seir and the sons of Esau, um, their families are intermixing during this time. 
That's why the, the, the Lord gives, that, gives them credit for this. But beginning in verse 20, uh, 31, we go to a different uh, time in their land, okay? So they were chiefs, they were friends, there was leadership, but it wasn't a high up and exalted leadership. It's a leadership of friends. It's a leadership of, of trusted, intimate people. Okay, fine. But in verse 31, at a certain point, fourth or fifth generation in, we don't know exactly, um, all of a sudden we see the appearance of kings. And the, and the first uh, verse that speaks about the kingships, uh, rather the second verse that introduces the first king, um, is very instructive, brothers and sisters. I believe that this verse describes the first king of Edom in such a way that it sets the tone for what's happening in Edom um, just a few generations after Esau arrived. So that verse that we're looking at is, is verse 32. Be, uh, Bela, Bela, Be, Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhaba. Now, the, the names here, and the Israelites would have seen this and heard this immediately, so they would have known exactly what, what the meaning of it was. So we'll start with the father. Beor is the father. Well, Beor means stupid, inhuman, cruel. So this first king, his father, is an ignorant brutish, strong, powerful, cruel person. And the idea is, is that he's teaching his son the same way. Now, the name Bela means swallowing up, gluttony. And so you have a father that is ignorant, harsh, and, and he's very strong, and, and then his, he names his son swallowing, right? Consuming. And the idea is this, so Edom's first king represents all the brutality of the world that rejects or denies God. His father was an ignorant and cruel man who taught his son to be heartless to his people and his son stripped his people of their possessions to satisfy his never-ending hunger and the name of the city, Dinhaba, means given over to judgment. And so what the divine writer is telling us is that that there's a trajectory here. When you reject the words of God, and, and, and brothers and sisters, I cannot emphasize this enough. We're, we're actually beginning to see some of the stuff come, come to play in our own country. As our country turns away from the word of God and from holding the word of God above all things, the idea of the equality of man, even though people are babbling about the equality of man more than they ever have been, they're really not talking about equality of of, of opportunity, they're talking about equality of outcome. Everybody must be equal. But the more they talk about that, what it's gonna do, it's gonna, it's gonna lead to tyranny. It always does. Because the word of God and what God gives us in the gospel, what God gives us in the leadership of our Lord Jesus Christ is the number one best and only way where the most people will be blessed. That's a fact, that's a reality. Every other path leads to some kind of tyranny down the road. Whether it's an oligarchy, whether it's a monarchy, um, whatever it might be, there's gonna be, it's going to be the old pyramid. Okay, The pyramid, there's a few people at the top, but as you go down, it gets broader and broader. And of course, the base is the biggest part. And what, who's going to be at the base? Those are going to be the people that are at the bottom paying all the taxes, doing all the work, no privileges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because that's who we are in sin. Remember what Jesus talks about when he's talking to his disciples. He says, the Gentiles lord it over one another. Why? Because in sin, that's the way we are. If I am gifted and talented and driven, and I can earn, and I can make a living, and I can grow my business and grow it and grow it and grow it, why shouldn't I rise? Why shouldn't I be considered better than other people? Well, why shouldn't I be considered as someone who has wisdom, and I should be up here while you're down here? But Jesus says the opposite, doesn't he? He said, it shall not be so among you. The least will be the greatest. 
And that's what the revolution, uh, revolution of Jesus Christ does. It flips everything upside down. It actually makes it so that the people who are the most gifted are the most responsible to care for others. If God has gifted you, because God does. He gifts people differently. Some people have, have far more gifts and far more abilities than other people. Th- that's not a bad thing. It's only a bad thing if we use it to our own glory and to our own benefit. Because sooner or later, it's going to come out that my own glory, my own benefit, the things that put me up here, somewhere else, it's costing others. And if God, you know, what the Word of God is telling us, if God gives you a a lot of ability and and a lot of gifts and you rise, then you're supposed to use that to help others. Well, Esau, they start out even because he's been trained by his father and there's some covenant knowledge there that all men are equal under God. But as they go down and they start working through the generations, we see that idea of lording it over the others coming out more and more. And that's just natural. That's what we are in sin, brothers and sisters. But just because it's natural in sin does not make it right. This, is, this idea of, of ending up with, with tyranny and tyrants in charge that rule by the fist, that rule by force, that rule by their strength and power over the rest, that is the history of the world. We take our, our history in America for granted and, and what we have that it doesn't look like that, we just take that for granted like it just popped out of nowhere. It did not. If you study history and all the great empires of the world, it was always a pyramid. There was a few, you know, people that had all the good stuff at the top, but there was a huge bottom where most of them were slaves. The Roman Empire, the greatest empire the the world has ever seen, right? 35 to 40% slavery. 35 to 40% slavery of every tribe, tongue, and nation. They had a lot of equality when it came to slaves. They would enslave anybody. Uh, so just a couple more things and, and we're done, okay? But notice also the seventh king of Edom in verse 38. So Saul died. When Saul died, Baal-Hanan, the son of Akbor, reigned in his place. And I find this just humorous because here's, here's the spirit of God. Here's the, here's the divine writer uh, interjecting something that I think is humorous, but it's also uh, there's also irony here. So Baal Hanan, Baal is the, is the name for Lord, right? Remember, a lot of people end up becoming Baal worshippers, and the, the the word Baal means Lord or Master. It's a name of divinity. So the seventh king is already beginning to, now it's not just enough to be at the top you know, of the heap. It's not just enough to, to get what you want and consume at the expense of those around you. No, no, now the kings begin to look at themselves as lords, as divine. They're divine rulers. Baal Hanan, now Hanan's interesting because it's, it, it's Grace. So his name is the Lord of Grace, right? He wants people to see him as a benevolent God, the Lord of Grace. But here's the the humorous part. His father's name is Akbor, and Akbor is mouse. So the Lord of Grace, the high and divine one, is the son of a mouse, which is actually just bringing us back to earth, isn't it? He's the son of an insignificant little being. And in the end, that's what we are. That's what man is. He's an insignificant little being. Even when he has a great name and he has power in his time, he will pass away in 100 years from now. No one will remember him. The Lord of grace is the son of of an insignificant little man. And in the end, he is an insignificant little man. He is not a divine being. I'm pretty sure that the divine writer is telling us something about the state of nations and kingdoms that reject God and prioritize themselves and their desires above the word of the living God. 
But brother and sister, finally, the, the, the last thing I want us to look at is the idea that this chapter is also a very powerful testimony of God's faithfulness uh, to his word in spite of man's rejection and disobedience. Listen to the words of, uh, of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness of the way of the Red Sea, and as the Lord spoke to me, uh, as the Lord spoke to me, and we skirted Mount Seir, so we, we went around Mount Seir, and it's not just the mountain of Seir, which was a very tall and majestic mountain uh, that was kind of like Esau's hangout, but it's speaking of all of Edom. So we went around Mount Seir for many days, and the Lord spoke to me, saying, you're about to pass through the territory of your brethren, your brothers, the descendants of Esau who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. And I'll just stop there for just a moment. Why are they going to be afraid? They don't even know. Except this is true. If you live by your strength, if you live by your wits, if you live by your power, underneath it, there's going to be fear. There always is. Because man has a sense of condemnation. Every human being is born because we're, we're born in sin and therefore we're born having a testimony inside us saying that there is wrath and judgment against us. And so we're always waiting for that other shoe to drop. And so these people see the people, the children of Israel coming and they don't believe their words. The Israelites come up to them and say, look, we want to pass through your land. We'll stay on the highway. We won't even take one grape. We will pay for water. We'll pay for food, whatever. We'll stay on that highway. Just let us go through your land. They won't let them do it. They're scared to death of them. But then, listen, therefore, watch yourselves carefully. This is still God's word uh, to, to Moses and to his people. Do not meddle with them. Do not mess around with them. For I will not give you any of their land, no, not so much as one footstep. For because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. God had given his word. He has spoken. And it actually goes all the way back to Rebecca. Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. And, and so what God is saying is, I have given, just like he told Abraham, right? Because he, he actually comforted and assured Abraham when he was sending away Ishmael. You know, that's my son. I love him. Lord, what's going to happen to him? Don't worry about him. I am going to make him a great nation. I'm going to give him 12 sons, 12 tribes. He's going to have a great nation. Don't worry. I will take care of him. And, this, and, the, and the essence of that is, is here with Esau, too. God has given his word. This man's going to have a nation. He's going to have a people. And I will protect it. In spite, in spite of their rejection and unfaithfulness to the living God. Now that can't last forever, and it, and it doesn't. But God says to his people, I gave them my word, and I'm going to keep my word. Think about us. So often in, in business, especially when we're younger, if we think somebody broke our deal, well, then we feel free to just break the deal back, right? And, and we think we're morally, uh, you, know, we're, 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 you know, we're higher up morally because they broke the deal. That means there's no deal. Now I can break the deal. But our God is not like that, which is really telling us something about what we're supposed to be like. The Lord has spoken concerning Esau. He will also bring forth a nation and a people. In spite of Esau's lukewarm and compromised relationship with God, in spite of his lack of faithfulness, God is always faithful to his promises. If God is this faithful to his word, to a man and to a people that have rejected him, how much greater is his love and his faithfulness to those who trust and those who believe in him. Think about that. Esau's inheritance was assured by God, even though, even though Esau had rejected God. And God protected that inheritance that he gave him. How much more so for you and I? And that's huge, right? Because Esau, 
wanted to, he want, you know, he was a big man. If you would have met him, I have no doubt in my mind that you would have been impressed by him. He was a doer. He got things done. He basically came and, and made a kingdom, right? Took out his enemies, put his sons in place, and his grandsons, etc., and built up this whole nation, this whole people. Very impressive human being. But in the end, his people end up being the enemies of God. And in the end, there comes a time where God's protection ends. But for the saints of God, you will give up things in this world. You will give up your desires. You will give up your ambitions to follow the path of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord says, trust in me. Believe in me. Because if you do what I call you to do, I will make you a most blessed and fruitful people. There's, there's a, there, in Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, which are very close to each other, there's a, there's a line in there. Um, Why are they in great fear where no fear was? The more that you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the more that you know the Lord and trust in Him and are walking in His ways, the less you have to be afraid of. And I don't care what's going on in the presidential races. I don't care what's going down around in, in the world. I do not care if, you know, even if the, the mountains are cast into the midst of the sea and the earth is removed. The Lord says to his people, I've got you. How much is that worth? For the children of God, it's worth everything. And that's exactly what this chapter is pointing us towards. Amen. Father, once again,